Lecture 22. The Jew, the Gentile, and the Church of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 31 to 33. Whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Verses 31 to 33. These words form a fitting conclusion to the portion which we considered in our last study. Paul has just emphasized the behavior that should characterize those who are linked with the table of the Lord. A table is the expression of fellowship, there is no place where we enjoy one another's companionship so much as there. We sit down to partake of the good things provided, and there is a feast of reason and a flow of soul, and we find ourselves enjoying fellowship together. In the spiritual sense, there are three tables, representing three great fellowships in this world. First, there is the table of the Lord, and that represents Christian fellowship. As we have seen, the loaf and the cup upon that table speak of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus, and we being many, all who have been redeemed to God by the precious blood of our Savior, are members of one body and so partake together of that one communion feast. Then there is that which the Apostle solemnly designates the table of demons. He is referring to heathen festivals, the kind of feasts held in those days, and that are still being held in pagan lands where devotees of idolatry gather together for fellowship in their abominably mysterious and unspeakably evil rites and ceremonies. Behind all this is the power of Satan. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice, sacrifice to demons, and not to God. In the third place there is what might be called the table of Israel. Are not they that eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? VE 18. That was called the table of the Lord, but when the Lord Jesus was forsaken these forms and ceremonies became empty. Yet today we recognize that there is that fellowship in the world, a fellowship which is neither Christian on the one hand nor pagan on the other, the fellowship of the house of Israel. And now the Apostle shows us that as Christians we are to live in this world having due regard to these different fellowships, seeking to bless all in each of these various circles. First, we have our individual responsibility to order our lives to the glory of God. Whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. How far-reaching is this commandment? I wonder whether we always bear it in mind as we should. I am quite certain that many of us as Christians would live very different lives if we kept this admonition in mind, whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That takes in my entire life. A great many people try to live their lives in sealed compartments, there is one compartment for the church, there is another for the family, another for business, and another for pleasure and recreation, and the same man may seem to be an altogether different person in each one of these. When he comes to church he is the essence of sanctimoniousness, he has a long face and reverent mien as he sits in his pew. You would not think an unholy thought ever passed through his mind. His eyes are either uplifted to heaven or closed as if in rapt meditation. But see that same man during the week when he goes out into the world in business. Now his eyes are never closed, they are never lifted heavenward, but he is looking about him furtively in a most anxious way and he is always interested in how he may make a dollar honestly or dishonestly. In fact, he sometimes does not make the dollars at all, he simply gets them. There is a great deal of difference between making money and getting money. We make money when we give a legitimate return for it, we get money without giving a legitimate return for it, and even professing Christians often engage in various nefarious schemes that would not bear the test of the word of God nor even a close application of the law of the land, in their efforts to get money. When they are questioned they say, well, you know what the Bible says, not slothful in business. That is a scripture that has made a great impression upon many minds. And then again this same man goes to his home, and there he is an altogether different person. In business he is so affable, at church so reverent and so solemn, but in his home where he feels he is best known he is sometimes anything but, but affable and solemn, he shows a miserably bad temper and is a kind of bore and makes everybody around him uncomfortable. You have possibly heard the story of the wife who said of her husband who was a preacher, when I see him in the pulpit, I think he never ought to come out of it, and when I see his behavior at home, I think he never ought to go into it. There are many people like that, they live one way at home and altogether another outside. 
John Bunyan speaks of a man as a devil at home and an angel abroad. These same people have another compartment in their lives, and that is the one that has to do with their leisure time, their pleasure. It is amazing to see the very person who looks so serious on a Sunday morning make his way into some ungodly movie or some other unholy place of amusement on a weeknight. I wonder how people can attempt to combine the two, how there can be any respect whatever for the things of God if they go on with the vile, wicked amusements that so many are running after today. We are not to live our lives in these airtight compartments, but are to do everything to the glory of God. If we gather with the people of God in the church services, it is that he may be glorified, if we go out to take our place in the business world, it is that we may bring glory to his name. A straightforward, upright, godly living Christian businessman may be a far greater testimony for God than a preacher. Men expect the preacher to unfold the word of God, but it often comes to them as a wonderful surprise when they see a businessman living out the word of God, and it appeals to them, it gives them to know that what the preacher declares is the right thing. The home is the place where perhaps above every other a man may show what a Christian really should be as in the presence of his wife and his children he manifests the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and seeks to lead those who are young in the ways that be in Christ. And then we come to his recreation, for a Christian needs recreation, a Christian has a body and a mind to be thought of, and needs to get out in the open and give a certain amount of time to that which is not so serious. But in his recreation he will say to himself, I am still to have this in view, that I am to live to the glory of God, and whatever I do I must be careful that I do not allow in myself anything under the plea that it is simply pleasure or recreation that would not have the approbation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can easily make the test by saying, if I do thus and so, would it disconcert me in the least if the Lord Jesus would suddenly appear, if he would look down upon me and say, what are you doing? During my unconverted days I had never been in a theater, but some seven years after my conversion I got into a low backslidden state and I said, I am going to find out what the theater is like. I felt like Moses before he killed that man, when he looked this way and that way to see if anybody was watching. I looked to the right and to the left, but I forgot to look up, for there was one watching me, the blessed Lord Jesus himself. I paid for my ticket and went in and the miserable thing began. I had not been sitting there long until I seemed to hear a voice say, What doest thou here, Elijah? And I thought, Where does that come from? Oh, yes, I remember, that is in the Bible. It stirred me so I got up and ran from the place. If you cannot enjoy things with the Lord's approbation, then you had better avoid them. If you want to be the kind of Christian who grows in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must order your life according to his word. We have a similar verse to this in the epistle to the Colossians, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks unto God and the Father by him, 317. If you call yourself a Christian, the next time you think of going to some ungodly place of worldly amusement, get down on your knees first and say, Blessed God, in the name of the Lord Jesus I am going down to the movie theater or whatever it may be to see some of those ungodly Hollywood divorcees cavorting on the stage, and I pray that it may be for my spiritual blessing and that I may be enabled to glorify God. If you can pray that way without biting your tongue for being a hypocrite, you may go, but if you find you cannot pray like that, you had better give the place a wide berth. I have heard Pastor D. E. H. Dolman tell that he was giving some addresses, before the World War, in a palace in Russia. He had been invited over from Germany by a Russian princess who was an earnest evangelical Christian. She had gathered together many of the old Russian nobility, and it was to them Pastor Dolman was speaking. At one of his meetings he was talking of the Christian's attitude toward the world. A grand duchess was there, and she was a professed Christian. At the close of the meeting, being a strong-minded lady, she spoke up and said, I do not at all agree with some th things that Pastor Dolman has said today. He turned to her and said, Your Imperial Highness, what have I said with which you disagree? You said a Christian should not go to the theater, and I do not agree with you. I go to the theater, and I never go but what I get down on my knees first and say, I am going to the theater today, and I want thee to go with me and protect me from all evil, and he always does. Your Imperial Highness, may I ask you a question? Where did you get the authority to decide what you were going to do or where you were to go, and then ask the Lord to go with you in it? Why do you not wait until the Lord says to you, Grand Duchess, I am going to the theater tonight and I want you to come with me, and then follow him to the theater? She threw up her hands and said, Pastor Dolman has spoiled the theater for me, 
for if I wait for the Lord to bid me go, that time will never come. That is true of a great many other worldly places. Give the Lord the opportunity to guide you and He will lead your steps in the right way. You may say, oh, well, whose business is it how I behave? That is something like the question Cain asked, am I my brother's keeper? If you profess to be a Christian, there are a great many eyes fixed upon you, people are watching you to see what a Christian should be and they are judging your master by your life, and if your life is worldly, mean, and ungodly, they decide that your master is not the blessed, glorious, holy Christ that your lips tell them he is. And so the apostle reminds us that there are three great classes of people who are looking on and he says, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Give none offense. He does not mean that we are not to offend anyone, for it is impossible to keep from offending somebody. For instance, if I preach the Lord Jesus Christ, I offend my unbelieving neighbor. If I try to live for God, I offend people who do not want to live for God. If I stand against the liquor traffic, I offend all those engaged in that abominable business and who are interested in it from the standpoint of revenue. It is impossible for a Christian to live as he should without offending somebody, but the old English word offend has an altogether different meaning. The admonition may be translated, give no occasion to stumble, do not allow yourself in anything that would give another occasion to stumble because of your inconsistency neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. Here are the three classes into which the world is divided. The Jews of old, God's covenant people, the people to whom he gave the revelation of his word and who preserved that revelation for us down through the centuries, the people to whom the Savior came, in fact, he was one of them, of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, Romans 9 verse 5. But that people reading their own scriptures fulfilled the predictions of the prophets in condemning and rejecting that Savior, and because they condemned and rejected him God has set them to one side. He went out to die, sadly saying to Israel, Your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Matt 23 38-39. And so because of their awful sin in rejecting their promised Messiah, Messiah, they are scattered everywhere among the Gentiles today. It may be that I am addressing sons or daughters of Israel. Let me assure such that every honest Christian heart goes out in tender sympathy toward Israel, with yearning and longing for their salvation. We realize that Israel having been set to one side, great blessing has come to the Gentiles, the nations outside to whom we belong, but we desire that God's ancient people may share these blessings with us. A Jewish lady once said to me, if Jesus was the Messiah, the one predicted by our prophets, why is it that it is you Gentiles who seem to enjoy the blessings that Jesus brings while we are bereft of them? I said, my dear friend, the blessed Lord came and spread a table laden with all good things and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he invited the people of Israel to come and partake of these good things, but they turned away and did not come, they rejected the Savior and the blessings he brought. It was then he threw open wide the door to the Gentiles and said, Come in, and take of the good things that Israel refused, and that is why we have come in, but we still recognize Israel as God's ancient covenant people and know from the word of God that the day is coming when their eyes will be opened and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his. Firstborn, Zechariah 12 verse 10 Meantime blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the gent Gentiles be come in. We as Christians are to live our lives consistently, carefully, before the Jew, we are to have consideration, we are to remember that judicial blindness has come upon him and are to commend our Christ to Israel by the godly lives that we live. I am afraid that some Jews might well be excused for rejecting Christ Jesus because of the behavior of those who profess to belong to Christ. Shame that it ever should be so. Perhaps there never was a day when it was more important that real Christians should confirm their love toward Israel than the present one. There seems to be a rising tide of anti-Semitism sweeping all over the civilized world. To follow the writings of some, one might think that the Jew is responsible for all our national and political ills. But we know who is responsible. Professing Christian people have turned away from the living God, have spurned his word, have rejected his son, have dishonored his Holy Spirit, and so God is giving the Christian nations of the world to feel that it is an evil and a bitter thing to forsake the Lord their God. But Israel we know is blinded, 
and many of them have turned away from the God of their fathers, fathers, and instead of being a blessing to the world they are a curse. However, the great majority of them today are simple, kind, earnest people. How dare we try to blame on them the ills of the nations? We as Christians should show them that our hearts are toward them, and that we desire to have them share with us the blessings which we have found through the one who came from them, Jesus of Nazareth, the rightful King of the Jews. But the Apostle says, Give no occasion to stumble, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, the Christless nations, all about us. Most of us are Gentiles by birth and at one time we were outside the covenants of promise, we were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, and today the great part of the Gentile world still remains in its ignorance and darkness and sin although 1900 years have elapsed since the Lord Jesus said, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16 verse 15. There are over a billion persons in this world today who are still without God and without hope. What a tremendous responsibility rests upon us as Christians to give the gospel to the Gentile world. You do not need to go across the sea to do that, you work with them day by day, these Gentiles are all about you. How careful we should be to give no occasion to stumble. I have said to some, are you a Christian? They have answered, no wouldn't you like to be? I have asked. Well, I have sometimes thought so but I have seen so many hypocrites among people professing to be Christians that I have not much interest. That is, is, of course, a very foolish excuse to make. It is as if I were to offer a man a $10 bill and he said, thank you, but I have seen so many counterfeit bills I don't like to touch it. It would be a very foolish way of reasoning. I do not excuse anyone for reasoning like that, for no one will talk that way in the day of judgment. When the Lord says, why didn't you trust me? No one will dare to look up and say, I would have, but I saw so many hypocrites among those professing to be Christians. But on the other hand you and I are to be careful that there be no possibility of people getting a wrong conception of Christianity because our lives are not what they should be. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. What is the Church of God? This is a third company. There was a time when the Church of God had no existence. You remember when our Lord Jesus was on earth after Peter made his confession, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Matt 1618. There was no church of God existing on the earth in the four gospels, but when you come to the book of the Acts after the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, you find a new company. The Apostle Paul, when speaking of what he was in his unconverted days, says, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And speaking to the Ephesian elders he says, Feed the flock of God, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, and he calls it, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20 verse 28. Writing to Timothy long years afterward, he tells him how he ought to behave himself in the house of God and adds, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. What is the church of God? In the first place, it is not a building in which we meet. When we speak of a church in that sense, we use the word colloquially. The church is the company of people who have been redeemed to God by the precious blood of His Son. At one time some of these people were Jews, in the beginning the great majority of them were Jews, and then God began to work in power among the Gentiles and the two together constituted the church of God, as it is written in Ephesians 3 verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. It was the Jew first and then the Gentile, and now all who believe form this wonderful company called the Church of God. Let me ever remember as I walk down the street that I am a member of the Church of God, as I meet with fellow Christians I am a member of the Church of God, in my home life, in my business life, I am a member of the Church of God. I cannot get out of the Church, so I always have to behave as in Church. Some people have one manner of behavior in what they call a church building and another outside. Parents will say to their children, you must be good in church. Let me say to every Christian, you and I must always be good, for we are always in church. We are members of the church of God, and we are to behave ourselves accordingly. Giving none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now see how the apostle says, as it were, I am not asking you to do something that I do not ask myself to do. He was not one to say, you do as I say, and not as I do. Even as I please all men in all things. 
of course he uses the word. Please in the sense of seeking to profit all men. You cannot please them in the sense of doing that which every man wants you to do. If you did, you would not please God, but we are to behave ourselves properly toward others. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Why is it so important that I should behave myself aright as a Christian? Because others who are not saved are watching me, and if I am not careful my behavior will perhaps be such that they will never be saved. They will say, no, I have no use for God, for Christianity. I have no use for the Bible, for I have been watching that man who professes to love God, to love Christ, and to honor the Bible, and I do not see anything in his life to commend either God or Christ or the Bible. We want to behave ourselves so that people looking at us will see Christ. That they may be saved. Well, then, there are some people not saved. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3-4. Scripture divides all mankind into two classes, the lost and the saved. Who are lost? Those who reject the gospel, those who live on in their sins and never come to Christ. Who are saved? Those who put their trust in Jesus, those who believe the gospel, those who come to Christ. My friend, are you lost or are you saved? Notice, it is. Are lost, not merely in danger of being lost, but you are lost now if you have not trusted Christ. If you are lost, you may be saved, and you may be saved now 